That's a tough act now for me to follow. We had a wonderful and sensitive uh, um, introduction into the topic by uh, Dr. Bob Sursk. We had a very good overview provided by um, my colleague Mark Shaver, and we had the science in a very, very nice manner um, shown to you uh, by Sato-san. Now, uh, you also heard that this is uh, a business because it's hard and not because it's easy. So you will hear now from me uh, most likely um, about the um, uh, practical work that a flight surgeon would have to do. And in so far, it shall provide a link uh, between what you have heard until now. So, so what you have seen, sorry, <laughs> I was too fast. This is not at all uh, the trajectory of the low-cost air carrier that brought me to Australia for the first time. Um, <laughs> that is the trajectory of uh, a person that is very important to all of us, and I guess particularly to you. Namely, it, is, um, uh, it has been the route of uh, James Cook, and James Cook obviously brought uh, came with the endeavor uh, to uh, Botany Bay, as I learned, and there is a lot of uh, direct link to space, I have to say. What eventually not everybody knows is uh, that uh, the Endeavor mission, HMS Endeavor mission under James Cook, was uh, actually originally to see a Venus transit, if I'm right, and um, that was a main goal of that mission, and it was achieved. And um, we have in mission control in Houston a model of the endeavor, and we have got, obviously, we had the STS, the spacecraft transportation system endeavor. And if you want to reach out for space, it appears that it is not a bad idea to join the Navy, because both were captains of the Navy. So, uh, SDS-49 brought up uh, and fixed a communication satellite. So, also this is kind of a parallel between the two businesses. And this is my way in trying to get rid of being nervous and trying to say thank you uh, to you for the organizers, Australia and the ICRP for having me here. Um, with this, I come to the boring part. <laughs> uh, I hope uh, um, it does not get as worse as the title is. <laughs> Operational Radiation Protection for Human Space Flight, and indeed, it's my very interest. I want to protect the astronauts. My job still is, as far as I understand it, uh, to be of help. And I'm a radiologist, and I've got a, a strong interest in natural science. So what, if you bear with me before the lunch break, uh, uh, will come up is um, one way to organize it would be um, the human robotic exploration, our medical operations in it, the international space stations, but the new spacecrafts and the um, challenge th uh, challenges that we have as operational flight surgeons with that. And then of course uh, what you are here for, namely the reach out and the exploration. Another, eventually more down-to-earth way to look at it is, I will show you a bit about ESA, the European Space Agency, and uh, our home of operations, the EAC. I will tell you a bit about ISS missions, about operational protection and more, and human space and ionizing radiation findings. And uh, finally, uh, a bit about health and health risk assessment. So ESA is a civilian organization uh, that merges 22 member states. There are uh, programs that are uh, mandatory. All uh, partners pay into that and others that are optional. And of course, money is involved. And the only reason why I want to show that is to make uh, you aware that, of course, human spaceflight is just one among others. Uh, uh, that is uh, there to be fed and taken care of. ESA EAC, the home of the European astronauts and the home base for training of all international astronauts is located in Cologne. So also we had the pleasure to have Bob often in 
our facility and we are looking forward to get him again. Our charge, namely the one of uh, ESA Space Medical Operations and Space Medicine is the, to support the astronaut selection medically, to uh, yearly certify and recertify medically uh, the European astronauts not only internally vis-a-vis -vis ESA but also within the uh, space agency multilateral boards, so it is a standardized worldwide or multilateral procedure. We support obviously all things that are critical to health, and there are a lot of them, like uh, uh, dangerous activities during training, uh, rescue uh, uh, procedures, but also the day-to-day -day business, uh, be it from a dental that can be uh, a difficult thing to do if it occurs two days prior to launch, up to, um, I was fighting banana spiders <laughs> and, and, and uh, trying to arrange sandwiches of particular nature, so there would be a lot to say. So finally, we make them uh, eligible to go to this wonderful place, the International Space Station, and if I manage, yeah, I don't, here, now. This little tin can, <laughs> if you may say, is uh, the European contribution to the International Space Station. Of course, there is more, but this is the one that is obvious. And uh, usually we flew, that is uh, um, uh, the time that I covered, which is way more than decades, so with the International um, Space Station being approached by the uh, Space Shuttle launch system, and you see here uh, a shot from Cape Canaveral, um, and uh, by now the Space Shuttle unfortunately is retired. Uh, we still, of course, have the working horse Soyuz, which brings now up, it's the only human-rated approach to the International Space Station right now. Uh, so we launch out of uh, Kazakhstan in Russia, we do the preparations at Star City, all the astronauts that uh, go to the International Space Stations have been there, and so are we to prepare them and to get them back from space. Uh, these are some impressions about the area we are talking about in Kazakhstan, and uh, there are, of course, multiple launch sites. The one that are used for human space flight are Cape Canaveral, of course, uh, then Baikonur as the, uh, the Russian international launch site, and Isa Kourou uh, is used uh, not for human-rated space flights, but for uh, um, satellite operations. What goes up shall come down, particularly if you're an operational flight search and you want to have a healthy and, and uh, um, a crew member in well-being prior, during and after the mission. Uh, that can be a challenge, uh, though I did my uh, first management course and uh, you see the others have to carry my astronaut <laughs> and I'm already on the uh, all-terrain vehicle, um, but that is actually rare. Usually it's the other way around. <laughs> So if you are there in the International Space Station, what's the big deal? It's, uh, it's well, at, uh, uh, it has got a nice temperature, the pressure is okay. So you have got a nice view, of course, that you cannot buy on Earth. However, it's a bulky place and it's a busy place. And, um, and actually, um, I do apologize, and actually, that's it. Sorry. And actually, um, uh, maintenance is an important part of the work, so not everything is a glorious EVA. Uh, we heard already about it, it's a lot about maintenance, repair, and uh, organizing your stuff and the stuff of the station. Um, what are they supposed to do there, the astronauts? What are we supporting them in doing it? is research and the astronauts, you have to understand, is not an entity that has got jo one job, has got plenty jobs. It is a Russian flight engineer, it's a pilot, it's uh, an environmental um, 
an environmental uh, person that takes care about the situation on the ISS. It's an engineer that repairs. It is a delegate and a representative of his agency, of his nation, of a multilateral uh, um, approach. So there are so many things and so many challenges to the astronaut that indeed uh, um, medical care and the opportunity to talk to family and the opportunity to have five minutes for yourself is an essential asset. So what are they doing in relation to uh, medical care on the ISS is of course a lot of training they have to maintain their capability for self-rescue. It is medical, and we heard already about uh, ultrasound being one, if not the, uh, uh, means to get uh, uh, diagnostics and imaging on the ISS. Lately, we had a strong um, uh, emphasis on eye examinations, intracerebral um, um, uh, pressure of the brain, and so a lot goes into that direction and we even fly now an optical coherence tomography device which is fancy and came lately to check uh, the retina which is a kind of a premiere to get something like that in a fast manner on the ISS. And then of course uh, the discipline that all of them like the most is extravehicular activities and I don't want to bother you with another story about uh, the uh, relationship between Endeavour, Australia and space flight, but there is one. The same STS uh, space shuttle air, uh, spacecraft brought this wonderful device here. <laughs> um, AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, onto the ISS and in these days it gets repaired uh, by um, uh, the astronauts that are on board the ISS and this is exactly our, your domain, namely about radiation experienced in space. So how about the day-to-day -day business? Uh, they are supposed to have uh, 8.5 hour, uh, hours undisturbed sleep and it's among us, operational flight surgeons, to grant that, which is kind of more than difficult. And then we have got the 2.5 hours that I told you about for training, and these are the things we really, we monitor very, very closely all their activities. We try to explain every entity that an astronaut is a human being, it's human spaceflight and not a guinea pig and not a robot. So, and that is, of course, given the entire environment and the exclusivity of the situation, it can be really hard. What you see on the right side is uh, actually in, um, a part of the onboard short-term planning, which gives a lot of information about sunset, communication, and the tasks, of course, the astronauts have to do. Also, the ISS is a very busy place, so it's not that every other year there would be a spacecraft coming, but uh, by now we are so experienced that we manage well and they do not need to fight any more about food. Um, <laughs> still, uh, it is a tricky business in, um, in microgravity uh, to get your, in quotes, weight, so your mass, and um, you have to to be very innovative, like the Russians here, to help to, un uh, to support the cardiovascular system, for example, to avoid um, uh, fainting after landing, for example. So we also have had close calls, so the very same European astronaut that is now on the ISS doing EVA again, experienced a situation that nobody expected. He got water into his helmet, and as you can imagine, during an EVA, uh, there is no way in open, opening the visor and getting rid of the water. So, uh, luckily it turned out well, but it was indeed a very close call. And as you all know, and I as a physician, have also to remind the uh, community that not all days are good and this, that this is a reality that we have to face. So there are situations which are not that 
uh, um, uh, glamorous and uh, it is always wise uh, to prepare for such scenarios as good as you can. But I'm here to, to uh, I want to be here to be as inspirational as Bob Thirst just was, and I admire that really. And the motto of this meeting is Mining, Medicine and Mars. So I uh, want to come up with some shots about moon rocks that were collected at, uh, obviously, uh, uh, NASA, as you see here, a very early shot of mining, an artist concept um, uh, of mining on the moon, uh, the early days of space medicine, and then I cheated a bit, I have to admit, and I hope I do not <laughs> violate any feelings about a holy and wonderful place that obviously I have not seen before, but uh, um, I, uh, I couldn't resist to show you that. And it's, of course, taken from space. So now to the actual topic, which is a part uh, of my work and I understand it as an essential part of my work, ionizing radiation in space. But you have to understand, and eventually many of you understand the situation, it is much harder to sell than, for example, fitness and training. So uh, you heard already about it, that uh, our main uh, uh, phenomena to deal with are galactic cosmic radiation, solar particle events, trap belt radiation, and of course then secondaries with which come out of the interaction between the matter that we brought up into space and the human being inside that matter. And to get a bit of historical again, it is uh, an Austrian US physicist that did the first uh, measurements in a balloon. Uh, um, and later on it was the statement created uh, uh, space is radioactive. You see other stakeholders from your community, you are well aware, uh, like Sievert and, and Gray. You see Luca Pamitano, the European astronaut, which is up there and just fixing AMS, uh, as others do. So, of course, it's just because uh, it's a European. And then on the left side, you see, among other, James Van Allen, who uh, um, is uh, the one that um, was responsible for the research on the, what we later on called Van Allen Bells. The peculiarities of radiation in space you heard very nicely already. Um, after all, for a simple flight surgeon, it's about the energies, energy spectra, it's about the composition of radiation, which you, as far as I am concerned, you cannot, still not mimic entirely on Earth. And then, of course, the dynamics, so it's not a static field, it's something that makes us um, being aware at all times. You heard about the solar cycle activity, uh, which is kind of, to some, counterintuitive. If there is a solar minimum, we have got a lot of galactic cosmic radiation. If there is a solar maximum, we have got a higher likelihood of solar particle events, which will be the challenge, among others, radiation-wise for exploratory missions, because we are outside uh, the protective hull of uh, the uh, Earth. Uh, we go beyond what we call low Earth orbit. And the impact of that is, sorry, the animation did not work. What I wanted to show you here, that the solar cycle has got a direct influence on the radiation environment, as we heard already before. Also, we have to consider that uh, um, the abundance of protons is just exceeding everything else. However, uh, to be hit by an iron core is probably a different story and truly a different story uh, um, if you are a human being. And what we found is, and what was described, and this is again reaching out to our in quotes, day-to-day -day business, our peculiarities like the South Atlantic anomaly. So we as flight surgeons have to take care based on the good information that we receive, for example, by Shrek and the other entities about our scheduling of an EVA and to avoid to go at main times through that South Atlantic anomaly. What we do practically day-to-day -day business is not that glamorous. We have got 
uh, a passive uh, dosimeter, which is fancy, but it's uh, uh, to uh, uh, it is it's not high tech in that sense. Uh, um, that it would be an active device on which you could read the day-to-day -day doses or the dose instantaneously, but it gives you a reading uh, that dis uh, can distinguish low LET contributions, high LET contributions, and contributions by galactic cosmic radiations after etching of uh, plastics. Then we have got a science that we executed, of course, so we had a Matroshka model inside and outside. We we are on our way to get a better understanding of organ doses. And finally, we managed also to get some, as European Space Agency, medical operations. We, uh, we got some technology demonstrations on active dosimetry, meaning you have the opportunity to read out instantaneously your dose. And you see here uh, um, uh, the basic unit uh, that carries the data and mobile unit that can be used for individual monitoring or area monitoring. These are the results, and uh, they give you an insight into the different scenarios of radiation in low Earth orbit. And then uh, we have, of course, a lot of pertaining uh, paperwork. You could only use it for shielding if you make it wet, because water would be a good asset to shield indeed. But we need that, and we will need the same for exploratory missions to have uh, rules of the game that we do not need to make the decisions uh, um, right, uh, that we do not make, need to discuss the decisions we do en route. This is where we want to go to, and we want to go there, there not obviously with uh, 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 the spacecraft that we had, but we want to use a new spacecrafts and we need to know as operational flight surgeons about the design and that's not easy because it's proprietary still we need to deal with it this is the first mission in which we want to do active dosimetry again also from the european space agency and finally of course we want to take part in the deep space gateway in preparations of returning to moon and this is the australian university with joy, I found that on the internet, and uh, the question if we could su uh, survive uh, a ride to Mars, of course, has been partially answered, but not really in a medical term. Uh, the parameters that have to be taken into account are the same, namely, uh, uh, among other space radiation, and the risks that go with it, and as far as medical goes, uh, the conditions en route are pretty much those that you can also experience on Earth. However, it's a different story if you are far away uh, from Earth, as we heard, and the option to go back to a, a definite care facility is limited or not possible. Plus, the ISS is a huge uh, station. Still, we have one rack for medical, uh, um, and we will not have that, and this is a shot with the gear that we had, the hardware that we had on the moon medically. So these times are over. We have obviously to come up with something different. And we are looking at the medical conditions that will occur or do occur and uh, take care of those, however, under the limits of weight, size, and mass. And this shot shall just, just give you an insight into the different sizes of the spacecraft, so it will not become easier. Radiobiology is supposed uh, to be the one, uh, one of the parameters that we have to understand, and as we know, it will affect all systems, and we have to avoid any additional exposures, so that's a no-go. And if we look at uh, what we have seen until now, it is actually light flashes, it is cataract, and that's it. And if you ask me, uh, as an operational flight surgeon again, of course I'm happy to, to, to understand that, but I'm not happy with the information and the thoroughness of practical information that I do have to make my calls. Because if I hear that 800 millisievert 
is appropriate to go to, uh, to uh, space, then I have to make a simple equation. A German airline commercial pilot would have a lifetime limit of 400 millisievert. No, I'm already waiting for the first, actually I'm not, but uh, for the first question, what is so different between a, an airline pilot, a commercial airline pilot and an astronaut? Well, there is a lot of difference. Still, they are both the same human being. So, and as we heard already before, acute radiation syndrome is what we have to understand and to avoid. That is the basic charge of all radiation protection. So actually, Seaford, the unit is not applicable in an environment where you can have deterministic effects. And then uh, degenerative tissue uh, changes are the ones that we want to look at. Carcinogenesis is uh, the usual suspect, but also there you can have a more differentiated approach to that. And then uh, CNS systems. So this all goes into a matrix to understand um, the risk because we need to make easy an easy as possible approach to a risk assessment to convey our message. And that's something which is, uh, uh, to speak with Einstein, or is supposed he has said that, is we try to make the things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And that is an important message to my mind. And so we are on our way to have a European risk model. And that means not that we want to be competitive with other models, we just want to make sure that we are on the same page when we are communicating about risk and that we are on the same page when we look into the parameters that go, that go in such a model. And that might be truly different. And this is why I'm very thankful to ICRP having now this task group and I hope that both worlds, namely the space environment and the earthbound up to now ICRP can uh, have a benefit of that. Actually, that's my strong conviction. So if you ask me, let's go. But being a flight surgeon in German, I would tend to say very carefully. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, uh, I would like to say thank you again uh, that you are bearing with me. And if that all didn't work out, then eventually I try to sell EVA suits because I heard it's shark season. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ulrich. It's clearly a very interesting talk because there are many, many questions. We won't get to them all, so you'll have to chase them into the coffee in a few minutes, but let's try and do a couple at least. Uh, one very quick one, I believe. Uh, do you include medical imaging doses in astronauts' career exposure? Um, um Yes, as good as I can, uh, because they need to be reported. Uh, I'm not the police, I'm a physician. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, you need some information to make that, uh, 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 this assessment valuable. And the problem, of course, also um, is an occupational one. You very well know that uh, um, it's always a debate uh, if you would use such examinations or medical care uh, um, uh, burdens into a system that may rate you. So there are pros and cons and that's not an easy topic and it will not be because it's about certification, flight opportunity and so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, the second is kind of two part. Can, and also uh, coming from a question earlier in the session, can you comment very briefly on what long-term follow-up and care there is for astronauts who have been in space and uh, related to that, uh, what evidence is there for cataracts and astronauts have, who've spent time in space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that is a pretty mature system. Uh, we have got a certain uh, amount of time in which we indeed are in charge. It's an engineering environment, so usually we are not in charge. But uh, after a mission facing the real changes to physiology, humans are not created per se to go into space and uh, stay there for a year in microgravity. But as usual, I think that's another positive part of human mankind, they can cope with it. So uh, the impact that we see after landing 
uh, depends on their training status, it depends on uh, their nutritional and fitness status, as I said, and this is what we take care of. We do all the diagnostics, uh, we do a lot of physiotherapy, uh, so uh, that is a pretty down-to-earth approach that is uh, very well uh, consolidated. So a last one before our time runs out, maybe we'll squeeze in one more, we'll see how long the answer is. Yeah. Can you comment on the work that's done on measuring uh, chromosomal aberrations before and after flights and whether this is useful? <laughs> useful to whom? <laughs> yeah, um, well I find it useful because I'm curious and uh, and uh, so actually the Canadian Space Agency did a big deal and so did NASA in looking very thoroughly uh, uh, to the best and highest standards into chromosomal aberrations and of course you find something but just the end the number of astronauts that you have and the conditions that require us to take such samples makes it really, really hard to draw conclusions out of it. So if you ask me as an operational flight surgeon, what do I do with my result out of biodosimetry vis-a-vis uh, -vis the astronaut and his family, if he says, well, so what does it tell me that I've got so and so many double strand breaks and these and other changes, will my children be sick or what is the deal here? That is as anything that is related to genetics and changes of genetics, a tough topic and uh, so this is an area where to my mind we should be open and and uh, um, and really try to gain that information but we must understand that all that does not take place in a vacuum so we have to I'm sorry again to be very 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 careful with such data and the use of such data so the answer is um, a clear yes and no. An excellent answer from a scientist. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will ask one more question but uh, a fun one leading into the to the coffee break uh, but just to note a few of these will be brought forward to the panel session because they're excellent broader questions. So there's a, there are a couple questions about food on the space station, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and specifically a few people or one person has asked with some thumbs up beside it, uh, have you considered high level of antioxidant foods for radiation protection of astronauts? So the practical answer is no, right now not. Uh, um, the good message is that uh, nutritional status and nutrition on the International Space Station is more and more a subject not only of feeding the astronauts and keeping, uh, keeping uh, them in a proper status, but also understanding what is actually going on in space with nutrition and metabolism. Um, you hear the wonderful miracle uh, word omics everywhere, so um, uh, that would be a side topic of incredible amount. So up to now, uh, nutritional status is mainly, is there enough good food available? And it is slightly starting, but that's my personal opinion, it's slightly starting to have a consolidated scientific approach to what it actually means and can mean in day-to-day -day operations. Thank you very much, and I hope some of it's also delicious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll leave it at that for now. We have a break for the next half hour. Some of the questions will come back to the panel, but also uh, please grab any of the speakers that you wish during the, not physically, during the uh, break. And thank you very much for looking at all the speakers.